meaning i mean to make some product we have to uh, we have to uh, sell some product to the consumer and they pay money that comes as a revenue so they pay cash let's assume they they are paying cash and to make the product i i need raw material i need to pay someone right so those become those becomes uh, payables so that's also part of the operation right to make the product i need some suppliers and the, the so the statement the cash that's coming from the from the customers and the cash that's out, out going to the to the suppliers that formulate the operation space when it comes to the investments i mean if i have a holding cash and i like now like i mean if we have you you have a house but you have some extra cash but you're not going to make that extra cash sitting in your checking account beyond a certain limit maybe about 10 20000 in checking account but beyond a certain limit like you would want to see like uh, what you would want to put it in a savings account or a cd account or the, if you're not doing anything in the stock market or aggressive or if you're not investing in real estate or somewhere so you, you look for a, some kind of a small savings account where you have flexibility to take the money out right that's a, that's part of the investment so whichever is whichever is sometimes you can choose a five year savings cd or uh, uh, sometimes it, uh, it could be a one year cd like it doesn't matter whether it is a short term or a long term investment so where you are holding your uh, your uh, cash a little bit for uh, in a parking lot that's uh, that's the investment the financing i mean in this case like uh, see we are able to buy the home for 400 dollars but but i have only 100000 dollars but uh, even though i bought i have only 100000 dollars i am able to buy the 400000 dollar home by uh, by going into the market and going into the bank and getting that 300000 dollars right so that's one way of bringing another way of doing it is i might not take a loan from the bank but i might go to my uh, one of my friend and then say hey like uh, uh, give me 100000 dollars you own 25% of the house but i and i i do pay interest on the money what you financed whatever whatever the structure of the deal right i mean he gets ownership in this house uh he or she gets a ownership in the house so i'm raising equity uh, I'm, i'm i'm raising money but i'm giving away the equity in the home so the profits that generate the house generates or the income that house generates is owned by both of us in a certain proportion right that's a that's the capital like in 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 our case like uh, when they issue new shares that means they are asking for more money from outside right and uh, so that's a that's one form of financing the other form of financing is by debt by writing a note by raising a raising capital using a note so that's a, that's a two forms of financing so when you go a little more in depth right i mean there are, how can we uh, there are three statements but how can we analyze these statements right i have the three financial statements so there are multiple analysis models that are there there is a there is a fifth model like which i had not written but we, but in delphi and we do support that model and i would show you like uh, when i when we go to the platform that's called common size common size analysis so the horizontal analysis is basically a very simple analysis where you can uh, uh, analyze year over year right like this yeah so horizontal analysis is uh, in the three statements your main motto is like to look at are the assets growing than the liabilities and you would want ideally you would want assets to grow more than the liabilities right and the liabilities should continue to decline and assets should continue to grow and is revenue growing and what we did apple in terms of revenue growth year over year growth right we compared year over year growth in the first chart very first chart beginning of the webinar what i showed that one that one is nothing but horizontal analysis i'm comparing last year versus this year and the previous year to last year and continued continued that for several years so uh, and also like uh, each measure like on the profitability aspect and also like uh, on the debt is it raising or decreasing so that that's exactly what we intend to use uh, or to find out in the horizontal analysis 
An example would be in the system would be like this. You go to this overview on the financials, the income statement. So this is here we have this uh, year over year, right? Year, uh, the, I mean, in 2010, we were making 65 billion. 2019, Apple is making 260 billion. So across each year, you can see the numbers and each each value that comes. So when you, when you really see in CNBC or uh, somewhere like uh, uh, other pre uh, websites like which show the fundamental values, the financials. They show typically about three or five years max. Uh, they show you that one, and uh, and also it is written in the opposite way. I mean, like uh, in even if you re read an annual report, right? They write it backwards. They, these lines will be this side, left side, and these these numbers will be on the reverse side, because you would they would want you to read that way because the latest is on this side. But I. We rearranged a little differently because you want to see. We are used to seeing the graphs like this, easier and I, and easy to read and easy to understand and make an inference rather than, oh, okay, in the screen, like look at this way, right? So, like any other natural chart, we would want to show you this one, this model. So, likewise, uh, likewise, uh, if you go to the balance sheet and you can see this balance sheets coming in, uh, the We'll go a little more in depth in each one of these. But I would want to see only what is horizontal analysis. Also, you can select the dimension, annual or a quarterly or a TTM. TTM stands for trading 12 months dimension. So as of March 31st, 2010, uh, when I click on this one, Apple came out uh, on uh, March 28th. Uh, they technically, when they did the earnings report on this one, uh, uh, they came out on uh, Mar May 1st, I think. When they reported, they are actually reporting for the quarter of the attending that ended 328. And if you go here, the financial year ends in September for Apple, and each company has a choice to make uh, when their financial year ends. So there's no mandatory rule that every finance every company has to end their financial year in December like our regular calendar year, right? Every company has a choice when they are forming a corporation, IRS asks them, okay, when are you, which month are you ending the, what date are you ending the financial year? You can choose your, your own date on your own month. So based on that, this one will be uh, the annual report. When you click on the annual report, that's where you're seeing all September's reported here because they choose September. And there is a, there is a way to, they selected, like it is a, third Monday or third Friday of that one, like uh, or fourth Monday of that one. That's how they selected that annual end year ending. That's where you see the odd dates. So, but if you select the TTM, um, this was the annual year, and there, there are two quarters that they reported. So this is including, this is including reporting the net income, all the 12 months, uh, trailing 12 months together. This doesn't seem to be right. Huh? So this reports like, yeah, the TTM number doesn't seem to be right. Oh, sorry, that's correct. I'm looking at the, yeah, see here, 267 million. So they were annually, we saw the 261, right? So their revenue is increasing slightly if you use this 12, 12, last 12 months of revenue, right? So next year, when they report in September, we'll see a slight increase in revenue. That's what this, this trailing 12 months number. So it will give you a, a little bit ahead of information what you're going to see in the annual report, like uh, later in the, by September 2020, right? So that's that's where TTM is more useful. I use TTM for most of the analysis rather than any other dimension. Okay, so this is horizontal analysis. The problem, one more problem is like, uh, if you look at this, uh, if you look at this uh, horizontal analysis, uh, I, like if you look at this balance sheet, right? I would want to see, okay, are assets equal to liabilities and equity? Wherever you are seeing these balance sheets, if you look at uh, here, uh, let's go to this balance sheet. Okay. Here I have listed all assets. The total assets is 320 and liabilities is $241. The 
uh, billion and the shareholder equity is 78 billion so total total liabilities and equity is 320.40 so these two are equal right so but it's very difficult for us to read this in this format so what we did you can you can click on this date you can click on this date and it will open up a, it will open up in a window and uh, this is a balance sheet and here you can see this is a horizontal analysis and and here this is asset section this is liabilities and shareholders equity very much very much in similar to this one assets liabilities and equity right so these two should be equal that's what we expect so here you are seeing like uh, the total of uh, 320.40 and total of uh, liabilities plus equity is 320.40 so there are also two types of uh, divisions in the assets I mean, one is short term assets and the long term assets in financial in accounting world they call it like a current current assets and non current assets but in the investing world for us like we can call it like a short term assets and a long term assets so short term assets are like a less than one year cds are called short term assets and also i mean if somebody somebody is supposed to pay you back and you you gave them some money or i mean maybe you gave them you gave a you sold a product on debt and they told you they are going to give it to you later little later so that's what is called net receivables so we'll talk a little bit more in detail like uh, each one of them but uh, there are there are good items good line items and there are bad line items so the good line items is like for example receivables that means you are selling the product you are getting the revenue which is good thing but you are selling the products on debt uh, so you don't know in this particular particularly the in the current context market context what we are going through in the covid-19 we don't know which companies will survive which companies will not survive for example the uh, uh, sweet tomatoes i bought a gift card in sweet tomatoes and that's gone the sweet tomatoes closed their shop the gift card is uh, i i gave them an unsecured loan the gift card becomes an unsecured loan which comes in the last in line for the payment even if they go for the bankruptcy and uh, they uh, if i go through the legal process i will be the last one i don't know if there will be money left for the gift card to be paid or not right so that's how that's how this net receivables also very similarly if somebody if let's say like let's say like apple had sold sold these uh, uh ipads and uh, uh max and maybe maybe around 1000 uh, max and 1000 uh, uh, ipads to uh, sweet tomatoes on debt so right now they cannot pay so right now they are in a state they are not able to pay but that money is recorded over here as a revenue for uh, for apple right so that 36 30.68 billion dollars will con- will have the money that uh, owed by the sweet tomatoes also so that's one of the reason why when i compare this when i compare this figure on the treaty uh, uh the march 28 2020 trailing 12 12 month comparison i compare with uh, by default i compare with last year same period 2019 uh, maybe like uh, yeah we'll take this comparison this comparison see the net receivables went up went up here 16% went up so that means in in march ending march ending uh, i mean 2019 march ending the net receivables was less than 30 30.68 billion about 16.74% so this went up this going up is not good for us because this is not this is a bucket where people will not be able to pay right so this bucket going up is not good for us that's why we color coded red here so if this bucket is coded green that means this going up is good so here this going down is not good because i would want my equipment my investments and uh, long term asset to grow and this declining is not good for me because i will not be able to sell the more probably my i am reducing my production uh, production because i am not in, in, increasing my investment in that in the in the longer term uh, profit generating model right so 
so this color codes also mean a lot and even though they are there are arrow going up and going down but this color codes also indicate a, indicate certain meaning of it so when i'm reading this balance sheet i clearly know which is good which is bad in that line item and that way it's much easier to analyze analyze what you want to do right so over here i mean you can also see the when there is a summary of the totals like uh, there is a clear bifurcation on the lines and uh, and this is a, this is a big e so we we give a big line at all and there is a meaning for shareholder equity also which we will discuss a little bit in detail like this later lines but here you can change uh, i want to compare with the three year average so this is uh, uh, when i compare to the three year average the net receivables uh, decreased which is good uh, that is uh, net net receivables is 91% decrease is good but there is a lot of uh, a lot of reds on the asset side in apple when i compare to the three year average and uh, and uh, and the good news is like there is a lot of greens on the greens on the debt side also like so that also decrease so which is good but the only thing that i am not happy is there is a lot of red on red on the equity which is not a good sign this is where the this is where the magic happened where they they are doing a lot of that financial engineering what we talked about okay so in a way like uh, we don't know what the what your use case is and how what your purpose of analysis is that's why we gave you the option of analyzing analyzing this one but if you choose uh, annual and then you will be able to analyze the uh, analyze multiple years you can also choose like a uh, starting from 2010 how did it perform so so this is all about uh, horizontal analysis so analyzing and making sure that uh, uh you're understanding what your focus is when it comes to the vertical analysis uh yeah in it comes to the vertical analysis it's not about uh, yeah oh, sorry yeah we have a, we have a al also american airlines also this is another topic which i want to talk about like boeing ceo talked about one of the big airlines uh going to be bankrupt right my guess i mean anybody's guess we don't know what's in his mind and we don't we don't know the exact answer what he what he which company he is referring to but most likely most probably uh american airlines is my guess like which is what he is talking about and the reason being uh we can as we go along like we we we'll try to find like whether that is there is a good uh, uh good analysis or not but if you look at uh, the short term cash position is very very less and if you look at their current assets is 8.21 and their current liabilities that means their short term liabilities short term in this accounting terms and short term and long term a very clear demarcation uh, irs wants short term as defined as 12 months and long term means anything greater than 12 months even if it's 12 months one day it's a long term and even if it is 12 months one day less it is a short term so uh, that's a very clear definition so in the next 12 months i mean as of as of uh, i mean 12 2019 ending 1231 as in the next 12 months between that means in 2010 it needs to come up with at least a 10 billion dollars cash just to pay the liabilities forget about the lost revenue forget about the growing liabilities and drop in revenue all of that just to just to pay the liabilities short term liabilities they would have to come up with come up with 10 billion dollars so that's a huge huge herculean task like right now i like, can even even the, and and the government only supported about 50 billion for the all islands together so it's uh, i don't think it's equal like comes uh, I and mean, out of the 75 75 25 was earmarked for boeing but they did not take that yet right so the so all and all like I mean, yeah american airlines is going to be very difficult it's going to be very difficult for american airlines to get that much cash in the short term so this is a, this is called a very weak balance sheet when your current assets are I mean, when you look at these these two items compare this and also if you look at the long term assets also 51 billion and the total liabilities is also 60 billion i can mean it decreased about 1% and but it's uh, uh, that is showing as green but when you compare these two it's not green i mean there is still a 9 billion dollar gap they need to come up with 
additional revenue and profitability that can bridge the gap. Maybe it will take 10, 20 years for them to. That doesn't mean American Airlines, despite this weak balance sheet, that doesn't mean stock price will not grow. The stock price could do what it wants to do. That means you have to be careful as a fundamental investor or as an investor, you have to be careful in identifying how much position size you will do. And if you are buying American Airlines, then would you buy a put to protect that one or not? If you buy a strong, maybe you, you're okay to buy a out of the money put, but American Airlines, you want you want at the money put. So that's that that's how you can use the choice. Uh, if you understand this balance sheet, you can choose choose and uh, when to use how, what kind of protection and how much protection you need. And in case you still want to go ahead and in, invest, right? But imagine this scenario. Magically, American Airlines Airlines starts making a lot of money, and they're able to bridge the gap. And they are going to, they are reducing this ten billion dollar gap here in the short term, as well as nine billion dollar gap in the eight to nine billion dollar gap in the long term, and shrinking that gap to a two billion or three billion. Imagine this hypothetical scenario. What do you think the stock market will happen? Uh, will do? The stock market will, as as soon as investors or the institutional investors see the signs of it, they will start buying the stock, so that pile, uh, making the stock price go up. So if you wait until the balance sheet comes out and to see that picture, the stock price is already baked in, right? So that's that's exactly what will happen. So that's why it's always every three months when the stocks come out with these reports, it's always good to see how how those how those uh, companies are doing in terms of uh, these investment balance sheets. In the vertical analysis, in the vertical analysis, like the point is. Not comparing, not comparing the euro. I mean, uh, uh, the overall uh, picture, but it is comparing about uh, uh, what, uh, like for example, in the in the assets, uh, uh, how much of a cash does they have? Do they have in terms of uh, uh, short term assets or the overall assets? So how? Uh, uh, let me show the example. It will become easier. Right? Yeah. If you look at the apple. Again, in the same vertical, you can say like, uh, see, out of the total assets that Apple has, 100%, 14% is in uh, short-term cash, which is readily available whenever they want. Like they can go to the bank, they can withdraw, they can do it, right? And sometimes they have marketable securities, uh, which is investing in companies uh, in terms of stocks. So they do certain investments like that. They can sell the shares anytime they want, and that also is uh, uh, that's called cash equivalence. It's not like it's not like a, uh, it's not like a cash, but a near cash. So these, I mean, uh, the 13 percent of the assets are in uh, are in risk, are at risk right now. Their short-term assets perspective, because this is the number where we are saying some companies could which are, which owe Apple. Could go bankrupt, and they might not be able to uh, convert this net receivables into the real cash. Even though they said they had the revenue, but they but they did not pay because they they bought that on debt, and so that could be gone. And so that 13 percent. When you see a receivables of uh, 60 70 percent, those are the companies in this particular market you would want to avoid, because you don't know how much of that 60 70 percent receivables. Uh, uh, will be paid back, right? So in this context, like that's a one definite measure that you can avoid. So here you can see, like out of the entire uh, liabilities, 73% is liabilities and 26% is equity. So wherever you are seeing this equity is is uh, way less than 50%. That's where like there is not much of a reserve. Uh, it's pretty uh, pretty less of a reserve what you have. So equity always serves as a reserve reserve money. Uh, then in case you need money, then you can always go back to the shareholders equity and get money uh, to support the, the liabilities as well as building assets. So that's the, this bucket is used for future as a reserve. So I would ideally want to see like wherever the 50% uh, equity. And 
I would I don't want to see 80-90% equity because they are not using the financial leverage uh, on the liability side. They are not taking enough debt uh, so that they can uh, cash on low interest rate and uh, uh, invest in the in the longer term uh, methodology that uh, can generate profits in the longer term, right? So it's a balance between balance has to be there between liabilities and shareholder equity. Uh, as well as how much debt you are taking versus how much long term you are investing also. So this vertical analysis on the on American Airlines, if you look at it, right? If you look at it, see that out of the entire total assets, uh, their their long term assets are eighty six percent. Let's compare this one. Next. See that here there is a short term assets of Apple in forty eight percent versus thirteen thirteen percent thirteen percent in short term assets, right? So these long-term assets, they cannot raise cash easily. They can, they, they have to do a lot of it, and and there is a, another 10% of a goodwill asset. Goodwill asset is uh, almost useless. I mean, unless you are a, a company where who have patents and who have licenses, and th- that way you can see those goodwill assets because patents, even though we are not converted that patents into a licensing model yet, but you have patents. Other than that patent assets, the intangible asset and the goodwill asset is, is almost useless. The reason why they have the 10% of their total assets as a goodwill asset is because they acquired the US Airways back in 2012, 2013. They, acquired, they made the acquisition in 2013 and they completed the acquisition in 2014. So they booked the goodwill in 2013. So when, they, when companies acquire another company, what happens is they pay a little more than what they actually value, right? If, if somebody has to acquire a company which is whose stock price is $100, and uh, they probably will pay around 15 to 20% or 15, anywhere between 15 to 30% more than what the current stock price is. So they would want, uh, they, w- they would have to pay 125, anywhere between $115 to $130 to buy the entire company. So, and that company has liabilities also. So they, are, they assume the responsibility of the entire liabilities on their new company. So they are not only paying, paying 15, 20%, 30% more than what the market share, market values is, also they are assuming the liabilities portion also. That means their asset, I mean, Literally, let's say, let's take like uh, somebody is acquiring this uh, 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 American Airlines company. Their long-term liability is 70%, right? So if somebody is buying American Airlines, they would have to pay somewhere around uh, $9, $10 right now. So probably they have to pay around $12, $13. And they, they acquire the entire company. They would get this 90 uh, 70% debt also along with that one, these liabilities also. So technically, they are paying way more, two times more than the assets they have, right? So accounting, in accounting side, they cannot they cannot say American Airlines assets are now two times more than what they actually owe in terms of uh, books in American Airlines. So when they merge the books, the IRS says you have to do a fair value only asset pricing for the American Airlines. They can say, okay, yeah, it's 1.1 or 1.2 times more. Uh, American didn't do a good job of evaluating their assets, but we did a value. They bring in an asset valuation expert and they do that valuation like methodically as, as depicted, as described by IRS rule books but they can write only 1.2 times. But what happens to that 0.8 times or uh, that overpay on the assets, right? That overpay on the assets, they, they said, okay, you can write it as a goodwill on your books. So that money is a dead money. It's not useful until and unless you use that new company, which is a merge company to generate more revenue. The way American thought was, even U.S. Airways merged with American, it will become a biggest airline. It, its network will grow. They'll be able to sell more and they'll be able to grow the market share. But if you look at the market share of the company, go to this uh, industry screen here.
in the transportation. Okay. So if you go to telephone gates here, you can see the yeah. Okay. So here you can see this market share and the revenue, right? Uh, so Delta is eighteen percent, American is eighteen percent, UL is seventeen percent. And the uh, rest of the other airlines are small airlines. Southwest is about 8.8%. And uh, there is another G and H, I don't know which uh, airline is this one. Yeah, this is a China, South, Air, South Island. Okay, they are listed in US market. That's why they're coming here. So these market shares did not change. I mean, as much as what they were, I mean, American was probably around same 18% back in 2012 also. So uh, we can change the date and then see here as well. Maybe 2014, well, let's double check the 2014. Yeah, see, American was 21%. So 21 percent back then in 2014, and uh, and and by now it is only 18 percent. So they didn't increase the their intent of acquiring an airline, wanting to grow the airline mar market share, did not suffice. So this, this that's a failure point. So when you book a more goodwill by doing acquisition, and the acquisition fails, the intent of the acquisition fails, and you are not able to generate that into money then that money is gone, right? That's one of the reasons why they are able to, why they are able to, uh, why they're able to accumulate their liabilities more than their assets, right? Okay, so that's one, that's one uh, uh, use case. So using this vertical, vertical analysis, you can pinpoint where exactly, what percentage of it is at risk uh, at, a, at a overall uh, anchor point. I mean, balance sheet has an anchor point of asset, Income has an asset uh, uh, anchor point as in revenue. Cash flow has an as uh, anchor point of uh, uh, revenue. So based on based on that anchor anchor field, uh, uh, how much percentage of it is at risk, or is it uh, uh, are we in a good spot, or are we in a bad spot? That's what we can say from the vertical analysis. So another analysis is relative analysis. I mean here, like uh, Ram asked. Uh, one question about uh, how do I compare the whether the Western Digital or uh, Seagate, which one is better? I mean, from products wise, Western Digital is better, and Seagate is uh, uh, Seagate is not reliable as reliable as Western Digital. From products wise, company wise, we have seen like the balance sheet, and uh, otherwise, like uh, it is the, exactly the opposite way, right? So there is no correlation in terms of how they are running that one. But at the same time, at the same time, when you look at uh, when you look at like a overall industry wise, is Western Digital and Seagate, are they doing good or bad? Maybe sometimes the industry itself has a problem. Like for example, airline industry right now, airline industry itself has a problem. Like so. I mean, we can't like, like uh, if you recall uh, Warren Buffett saying, the airline industry will come out, but it will take a little longer time. And there's nothing fault in, in these four airlines, but I'm quitting all the airlines in, as, as a term of investment, right? So that's exactly what he said. So he does have a, the entire challenge is like, uh, they can't go back to the 100% capacity right now. Uh, there's a capacity, there'll be a floor on the capacity for about at least two or three months. And at the same time, people also psychologically, they are not willing to travel as much as what they would, uh, they would have done earlier when you are, when 100,000, I mean, nearly 100,000 people lost lives. And so I think it's close to around 83, 84,000. And pretty in less than a week, I think that will close touch to about 100,000. We don't wish for that, but uh, that's, that's what the stats are saying. 
so unfortunately so in this times like uh, when i compare uh, a company to company we would always compare within the industry so the related analysis has to be done within the industry like i said like, apple and microsoft does not belong to the same industry so likewise we cannot compare so uh, a combination of vertical analysis also is very useful because like we saw like uh, apple has a uh, 10% in uh, Apple has a 10%, yeah, 13% in the current short-term assets. What if we compare this with uh, Delta Airlines, which has, uh, let's take a real numbers. Uh, Hold on, balance sheet. And I use the animal. So here we see like uh, uh, Delta has 12% uh, in current assets, but their current liabilities is 31%, right? And whereas here, yeah, this is also very similar, 13, 30%, right? So in this vertical analysis, you can see, okay, this 12% uh, here and then the 13% here. And uh, by percentage wise, you can actually see uh, a little more, little more clear uh, rather than dollars. Also, one other case is like, uh, I mean, if you compare the Southwest, let's compare the Southwest also. Like it's, a, it's a much less size co company, right? I mean, from a size wise, Southwest is uh, about six or seven times uh, smaller company. So here, if you see, yeah, this is better compared. See here, you see like 23% of the 23% uh, of their total assets is in short-term assets, and where liabilities are 34% still, there is a small gap. But this small gap can be bridged, and this is exactly what uh, the, what uh, probably you have seen articles about. Uh, Southwest will be okay, or probably Delta will be okay, bridging the gap between the between the revenue gap with the in terms of their current. Uh, uh, short-term liabilities versus the bridge funding that uh, uh, bridge loan funding slash grant funding that uh, uh, US government has given them, they probably will fly out for time. When this gap is way too high in terms of uh, in terms of dollar amount, see here like it's 5.97, it's about 8.95. So a small gap. They need only about three or four billion dollars over here. Likewise, in likewise in the Delta, I should have taken out the Delta. Okay, so here it's about 8.25 billion, and uh, Delta uh, Delta needs more cash, more cash right now in the short term than uh, than Southwest. So uh, uh, no wonder like Southwest uh, the the Delta grade and uh, see Delta grade is A grade, and Southwest also should be an A grade. This is an A grade, and it is also a hundred per hundred score. 100 score means leader in the industry right now. So uh, a close to 100 score is a leader in the industry. And Delta is he's a great, but he's not the leader like in the industry. So yeah. So that's how that's how this uh, relative analysis would be useful in terms of comparing one company to another company. And it's not a good idea to compare like uh, 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 I mean across the other industries. At the same time, uh, in Delphium, we also gave like uh, one more screen. The fundamentals where you can type in uh, can type in like a, see our yeah. our anchor point is uh, American Airlines. Okay, if you go to this relative financials, it is pulling up. Uh, it is pulling up all the airlines. It didn't pull up the uh, yeah. It did pull up Delta and uh, Southwest, right? So you can see the Delta is 47 billion, Southwest is 22 billion, and the uh, uh, American also is 40, 45 billion. I mean. So Southwest is half of uh, American level. So here you can also change symbols and see like if you are not seeing uh, 
uh, another company which you want to see like uh, the cups yeah like uh, another another company could be j blue yeah so we added uh, we added j blue also so about 8 billion company right so here uh, same process i mean you can you can click on this one and you can compare with uh, with the delta in terms of uh, uh, analysis i mean here yeah so we need to write an article on this one how to explain this little difficult uh, but if you look at this horizontal compare result so this is about 2.64% low lower revenue gross profit is 12% lower revenue 38% operating profit lower revenue than delta so this comparison number is coming from delta and here the that they are disclosing the actual number of uh, american airlines so american made 45 billion revenue and out of that gross profit is 24 billion operating profit is 10.77 billion so here it, here, here we are talking about 38% less operating profit than delta that means american is not operating efficiently as delta is like so in comparison to delta versus versus if you go to uh, delta airline then look at uh, look at that one right sorry uh no income stream compared to income stream see here they are getting a uh, operating profit of 17 billion 40 out of 47 billion 28 billion is a uh, gross profit and uh, here i think yeah it's 24 billion is gross profit 10 points 10 billion is a uh, operating profit uh here is 17 billion out of the similar 47 billion they are getting operational profit of 17 billion versus the 10 billion right mm-hmm. so that's that's where the magic is like so that's where the difference is this is exactly how we how we watch relatively within that company before grading the stock before coming up with that model like so. okay so when we when we do this uh, uh relative analysis it's very useful but at the same time there's one more type of analysis called ratio analysis so ratio analysis is basically uh, same same uh, similar to what we have seen like uh, current assets are uh, uh, 8 billion for american and uh, current liabilities are uh, 18 uh, billion so what is the ratio between these two am i will i be able to pay my short term liabilities from the short term assets so are we generating uh, are we using our assets properly to generate enough you know, revenue growth and is our debt under control like i mean is our leverage financial leverage too much or too less so also like how fast are we selling the products i mean so carrying inventory is not good but at the same time not having inventory some level of inventory is also not good imagine like we went to costco and we want to buy uh the cleaning utens uh, cleaning uh, products i mean last two months what happened like i mean it's very difficult to find a cleaning product on the shelf in the retail they are not carrying that inventory the manufacturers are not generating that inventory so it's not and the consumers are looking for it the demand is more than what the supply can be right so very generally uh, not every time this uh, demand supply equation uh it will become a bigger problem as it as it did in the recent times right so calculating the optimal level of inventory carrying would always be good at the same time i mean if you look at uh, if you look at walmart and between walmart and costco walmart prices are low costco prices are also low but at the same time they are a little bit better quality than uh, quality products but the pricing is little higher when you compare when you compare to the walmart one of the reason is like uh, they they hold concentrate on the bulk right costco concentrates on the bulk and the uh, walmart concentrates on the retail but at the same time when you look at the financial statements of that what it tells us is costco takes 12 days to sell the products what they what they 
get the product into uh, once they get the product in the, into their warehouse it takes about 12 days uh, for them to clear up the entire lot if you if you measure the same lot and one lot is being uh, uh, kept on the floor on the shelf uh, or in the warehouse in the walmart warehouse uh, delivered by the manufacturer and and the costco warehouse delivered by the manufacturer on the same day walmart uh, takes about 8 to 9 days to clear off that product go get into the consumer hands and costco takes 12 12 to 13 days and the problem is i mean so which one is better productivity wise inventory turnover wise so walmart can sell more product than costco that's what we infer from that right right but if you are a management if you are if you are uh, analyzing further uh, what if costco also can improve and what if scenarios then the problem could be the it, the day it is taking from a warehouse to the store or the problem could be the in the store to consumer itself is longer we don't know that problem in the financial statements so we do need to read and dig into much more in depth uh, notes that they provide in terms of what they are doing and and where they see the problems sometimes they disclose those problems sometimes they don't disclose those problems so those are the questions that you can ask if you join the earnings report that's what we that's what you can ask uh, uh, relatively comparison questions with another company and why can't you do or improve this improve this where is the problem and the, the management the coos the ceos and, and the line units like they will be able to explain those questions if you ask those questions so earnings if you are more interested in the company and if you want further more analysis what you what the story points what you don't get in the uh, uh, in uh, in the financial statements that's exactly what these analysts are supposed to do and and uh, supposed to uh, base off their analysis based on that one and not always like every analyst makes a uh, makes a good prediction but uh, but that's what we expect from the analyst like uh, covering those companies so the uh, ratio analysis is what like majorly majorly like uh, they are divided into uh, six different dimensions and uh, and uh, they they all talk about uh, either how well the business is equipped for future or how well the management is running the firm so those are the two main aspects of of this ratio analysis it is it is very big analysis in the entire fundamental analysis aspect like uh, bigger than the horizontal and vertical and uh, vertical analysis what we have seen so far so this here when we are talking about these six different dimensions one is a, definitely a liquidity uh, like exactly how we have seen the american airlines has a more liquidity problem than southwest uh, and uh, delta has a intermediate liquidity problem uh, and also the capital structure we did not review that for american airlines but we can definitely do that uh, if you review this for apple uh, this is talking about how much debt they have so if you look at this uh, uh, capital structure debt to equity uh, it's raising i mean they are they are raising more debt than uh, than the equity their equity is decreasing because they they are selling the shares they are buying back the shares so uh, they are reducing the money that's available and they are uh, they are spending money from the equity bucket uh, but at the same time they are raising their debt also but at the same time you you, hear, you always hear about uh, oh apple does not have uh, debt and apple has a lot of cash and apple is a cash rich company that's all true apple has a apple is a cash rich company but when you look at this debt right and let me let me take and then show you the exact problem what it is If you go to the balance sheet look at look at this uh, short term debt and the long term debt these line items so here long term debt uh, here there is the literally truly this is in 2012 steve steve jobs uh, left in uh, 2011 right so 2012 the culture has changed a lot in apple within apple it is usually usually when when you see a strong founder and a strong innovator leaves the company and there is a management layer that 
operations manage, type of managers that come on board and they become uh, uh, into the executive circle and this is a, there's a lot of uh, back and forth what need to be done what what should not be done like, uh, like some of those proposals inside the executive team probably are shot down by uh, Steve Jobs saying that that's not good that's not the route we want to take that's not where we want to be that's a strong stand so people don't talk about it but if there is a the leadership is not strong then they 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 bring all the other other mechanisms and and then particularly when the innovation cycle goes away they have to do some innovation some uh, financial engineering so here they started the uh, loading the 16.96 debt and and right now we are about 91 billion dollar long term debt we are talking about uh, i mean where from zero in a seven year period i mean this is way more than way more than uh, the higher growth rate than what the revenue is growing right so at the same time when you look at the short term debt also i mean they started uh, raising the short term debt 6 billion to 16.24 billion now the debt right the good news the good news is see if you look at this uh, cash flow their free, free cash flow they are able to generate generate the free cash flow right so they are turning this cash flow free cash flow into the short term investments as well their short term investments are also growing their short term investments are also growing where the 18 billion going to to 21 billion and then the long term investments also are going 92 billion uh, to about 105 billion not much of a growth but uh, this more than the short term investments the long term investments are more key because short term investment is cash so they are able to they are able to generate from this 100 105 dollars a billion and this 51 billion this is 156 billion and this net receivables they have receivables as of september 2019 they have 45 billion that other companies have to pay them because they bought those products but they don't did not pay them yet right this 45 billion assuming every penny is being collected and they have a 4 billion inventory assuming every penny every product is being sold not returned so all of these will become a cash or a short term cash holding so they earn interest on this short term investment 51 billion of course they they don't earn interest on 45 billion beyond 60 days usually they charge 18% interest rate beyond 60 days and it all depends on how they how they wrote the credit term for that particular company Well, Apple to other company, but general generally beyond 30 to 60 days they start charging interest rate. That way they encourage people. They want companies to uh, pay back within 30 to 60 days on the receivables. So, uh, so this 105 billion also will generate either the interest rate or if they are invested in companies, they either get back money in dividends or they either uh, get back in appreciation. One way or the other, they will get back some interest rate, right? so if you look if you look at the income statement if you look at the income statement they did not there is a line item called interest expense they did not disclose any interest expense here right but how come how come they raised about uh, they they are having right now as we stand today they have a debt of 91 billion plus the short term debt of 16 billion so they have about 107 billion dollars of debt raised and they are not paying any interest right in in actuality they are paying about 3 uh, to 4 billion dollar interest in uh, 2019 but actually the short term investments and the long term investments generated a billion more income more interest than what they are paying so they choose to disclose the net interest rate net interest expense interest expense as a net expense uh it, uh yeah so when i add the income from that uh, excess cash i had and the interest i earned on that excess cash minus the interest i paid on my own debt right so uh, yeah this so that's how they became interest expenses zero but in reality there is not uh, that's not zero so when will this become a problem when the when the debt is raising like this when the debt is raising like this when will this become a problem is in times like this 
assume that the receivables are 45 billion like right? 20 billion is not coming into the company and plus their long term investments and the short term investments short term investments i mean about half of them are in uh, uh, security investments so the stock market fell and they lost they probably lost around 10 to 30% we don't know that until they disclose they do we don't know how much of a fall impact that happened in the short term investment so assuming assuming when that balance is goes out of line and things when things which are not in their control take over and when they when the balance goes out of line that's when they will start uh, seeing the problems in the capital structure by being more debt by taking more debt that's where you start uh, seeing like apple stock coming down when when that happens so at the same time efficiency efficiency is about uh, moving the product like what we discussed on profitability is uh, how profit how how good are you able to run the company uh, fast enough and uh, valuation is basically uh, how fast i mean the uh, the valuation metrics are nothing but uh, you see on tv like uh, price to earnings ratio uh, i mean the eps is uh, 12 dollars right now and apple is uh, 300 dollars stock so 300 divided by uh, 12 dollar eps right so that comes to around uh, maybe around 28 times or something like that so that that's price to earnings ratio when as of 2019 the stock was lesser price so that way it came as 20.7 times that was a point in time capture but in the uh, delphi and you can uh, always capture the real time also real price valuation also so yeah we'll go we'll in the afternoon we'll go a little more in depth uh, uh, after the after the break uh, but uh, i'll stop right at this point and uh, I'll stop for questions any questions are there Uh, one question Dave says uh, seems like vertical analysis would be more important for growth companies, and uh, horizontal would be more for important for value companies or linear. Yeah, I, actually, we need a balance between both. Like, uh, we need to understand where the risk exists. It all depends on the market context, uh, Dave. Uh, right now, the having a receivables, a high amount of receivables, and a high amount of inventory is not good, right? In this market context. So that's what we would want to see in the vertical analysis. Like, I mean, ideally, I would suggest like practice doing both. Uh, yeah. So, and, and it all depends on like uh, the market context and what your analysis point of view, what you are analyzing, that becomes the key. Like, uh, which one is better? Like, there is no right answer of which one is better for uh, which type of company. But uh, yeah, horizontal analysis. Is what typically we see on the charts in uh, TV for growth companies because they get more excited. They get people more excited, right? I mean, when uh, like for example, Beyond Meat is growing about 100% uh, revenue right now. Like uh, so, that more uh, that excites us more to buy the company to look at the company, oh, what it's doing and uh, things like that, right? Rather than a company that's growing 5%, like right? it doesn't excite. That's what the horizontal analysis is being used used by marketers to excite people. Josh, any other questions in the chat? Yeah, the, <clears throat> the one question about American Airlines is asking why you would do um, in the money versus out of the money if you think it's still in bankrupt for a put. Oh, for the put, okay. Yeah, uh, good question. Uh, I think. Uh, If uh, you go to this, oh, sorry. Uh, see, when you go to this uh, uh, another model, there is another professor which created the model like uh, called Altman Z score. We'll cover in the afternoon a little bit. Uh, but if you look at uh, uh, American Airlines, pretty much like since long time it's on the on the verge of bankruptcy like I mean, even even then uh, they did go to bankrupt uh, they became bankrupt in 2011 right they did declare the bankruptcy in 2011 
but coming out of that uh, uh, i mean uh, part of the plan was acquisition of us airways that way they bring more revenue and they add more assets and uh, uh, us airways was uh, really more profitable back then like uh, uh, so so they thought like combining forces will make them come out of the bankruptcy model but the but the z score model says like you know, they, they were never out of the bankruptcy zone they were always uh, risk at uh, bankruptcy even at whatever price it was right so going by this i mean i would always uh, i would have always shorted uh, american airlines uh, but i would combine the shorting shorting with our state modeling also like so whenever there is a whenever there is a state modeling uh, the eight uh, the bear state that's when i would i would enter the timing of uh, buying the buying the state uh, shorting so buying the put <coughs> look at this look at this one there is a long run like i mean long time like it since here and almost 45 dollars like since about 2018 we are, we are revolving around the state age state age state age multiple times right so this is a definitely a shorting opportunity back then and shorting opportunity right now also and uh, there was one more uh, chat on the inventory counter intuitive what walmart would turn its inventory <coughs> faster in cost go I didn't understand the question. Like, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, we we need to look at the exact calculations when we go into the inventory turnover. Maybe we'll take an example and then we'll do the exact calculation and make sure. Like, uh, I quoted that as an example uh, for one of the years. We can look at it. Uh, what's standing right now when we go into that example later. <clears throat> okay, sure. Sounds good. We'll do a thirty-minute lunch break. That sound good? Yeah. Okay, so we'll Yeah. <clears throat> we'll resume at 12:35. Sure. Oh, uh, we'll keep the line open. Hmm? Yeah, I'll, so we'll I'll keep the here. line open. Mhm. Yeah. Yeah. So, um Okay, so 12:35. If you have questions in the meantime, just do Q&A. At the end we'll open up and you know, you guys can uh uh we'll open up the line so people can ask questions at the end sure okay thank you